Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. Good morning. Good afternoon. Welcome to the study. As we're about to go back into our study of Zechariah 4, I welcome you to join us now in prayer, in supplication, so that we may be instructed by heavenly agencies to the points that we need to be able to consider. At this time, we have much to address. We have much to consider. So shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance and his direction so that we may understand these things more clearly and be prepared for the lessons that he is yet to teach us. Shall we pray? Loving Father in heaven, we come before you on this Sabbath day. We thank you for this time of rest so we may separate ourselves from the cares of the world that is around us. Help us now. May our eyes be opened. May our hearts be willing to receive that which you would teach us. Show us, Father, that which we need for this time. We are all facing many struggles. We thank you for these struggles and these trials. We thank you, Father, for the discipline that you are placing upon us. For we know that the loving Father disciplines those that he loves. So for this, we praise you. Direct us now. Guide us in all things. May your will be done. As we open your word, may your angels attend us. May our spirit help our minds to be open and willing to receive that that you would have us to know. Guide us at this time. For this, Father, we ask. For this, we pray. And for this, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we're coming to the last portion of our study in Zechariah chapter 4. But we're going to cover a few things that we addressed this last week. Now, now, Mrs. White gives some admonitions in what is before you from letter 11 of 1889. Excuse me, letter 11 of 1899 and letter 89 of 1899. We need to beware lest we bring our upon ourselves the rebuke of God as found in Revelation 2, 4, and 5, and Revelation 3, 1, and 3. Now, we read these passages last week. When Mrs. White says we need to be aware, we need to beware, what is she saying to us? Is she not saying we need to be paying attention to that which is happening around us right now? Now, further in this other letter, she states, unless we are wide awake, we are not able to discern spiritual things. Now, I find this to be a reference to another parable. What is she saying that unless we are wide awake, we are not able to discern spiritual things? What parable is she giving a quiet reference to? The wise and the unwise virgins. So this is the ten virgins, right? So where do we stand? If we are not wide awake, all of the virgins were asleep. She's telling us to wake up. We lose the sense of the power of the truth and handle sacred things as we handle the common things. Where do we find an example of those that handled sacred things as they would common things? And what happened to them? Did we not see this happening with Nadab and Abihu? Did they not come into the holy place handling the censures that were ordained for service in the sanctuary, but applying to them common fire rather than the fire from off the altar? Did they not lose the sense of the power of the word of God? For is not the word of God the truth? Mrs. White continues, the result is weakness and uncertainty, and we are not safe counselors or guides. Wake up, brethren, for Christ's sake, 
wake up. You are not being sanctified through the truth. <clears throat> if we're not being sanctified, we have a problem. There must be laborers in the South who, present, who possess caution. They must be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. All who engage in this work should be men and women who have their pens and tongues dipped in the holy oil of Zechariah 4, 11 to 14. <clears throat> now, when we're looking at that, from Zechariah 4, 11 to 14, so that we refresh our memories, we read, Then answered I and said unto him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? Then I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches through which the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? And he answered me and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then said he, these are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. An unadvised word will stir the most violent passions of the human heart and set in operation a state of things that will close the way for the truth to find access to the fields now in such great need of workers. This is an admonition being given to us. It is not ministers who can preach that are needed so much as men and women who understand how to teach the truth to poor, ignorant, needy, and oppressed people. And as to making it appear that there is not need of caution, it is because those who say such things do not know what they are talking about. It needs men and women who will not be sent to the southern <laughs> by our people, but who will feel the burden to go into this neglected portion of the vineyard of the Lord. Men, while their hearts burn with indignation as they see the attitude of the white people toward the black, will learn of the master, Jesus Christ, that silence in expression regarding these things is eloquence. What other subject did Mrs. White refer to? where silence is eloquence. Well, one is the daily, but she, she uses it in other situations quite a exactly. bit. Exactly. <clears throat> she So it's not just in a situation. Right. And, and here, of course, the idea is that they're not going to stir things up, you know, the, the you know, all that stuff that goes on with uh, race in the U.S. I mean, they're supposed to be wise as serpents, as harmless as doves. Doves. So, even though their their hearts burn with indignation, they they're using Christ's methods, and and just ministering to the people who need ministry to. Right. Take heed as to what you say. There is a promiscuous pile of rubbish, in the shape of words, which needs to be cleared up and buried. Now, when she's speaking of a promiscuous pile of rubbish, I would have to look at the third definition for this word. Because promiscuous can also mean showing little forethought or critical judgment. We need to be able to consider carefully what we are saying. These words might never have been spoken, for they make a, a vast amount of mischief. Let each one look to his own spirit. Let each one look to his own heart and life. And by the help of God, cleanse himself from everything that defileth. Then he will be prepared as a cleansed vessel to receive the holy anointing oil. Mrs. White makes it very clear that we need to desire to be among the 144,000. Is she not saying the same thing here? That we should desire to carefully speak 
carefully consider what's being said so that we may be prepared as a cleansed vessel. For what what type of cleansing is she talking about here? As we've covered this the last several weeks. Is she not speaking of the gold tried in fire? Yeah, being cleansed by trials. So, <clears throat> the prophet of the Lord asked the question, What be these two olive branches, which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? Then said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. The golden oil is poured into clean, pure vessels to be imparted to others. This is what every soul needs. We want the holy communications from heaven and less rubbish of talk that only piles up difficulties. We want none of self and all of Christ. What kind of rubbish of talk is she referring to here? Are we to speak of rumors? Are we to speak of innuendo? Are we to be critical of other brothers and sisters? Read with me this next sentence. Consider this carefully. The work of purification is an individual work. So here we have the work of purification. Is the work of justification a group work? Is the work of sanctification a group work? So here we have now the work of purification. And it's being stated as being an individual work. Can you give your character to another? No one can. No one can. Correct. No one can do this for another. If a man, therefore, shall purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use. Second Timothy 2.21. The Spirit of God will work through human agencies, leading them to do missionary work. Ability and grace will be provided for the work. There will be a disposition to teach the truth of the gospel firmly, decidedly in clear lines from love to God and man. The cleansed vessel is prepared for the holy oil. How is the vessel to be cleansed? How is this vessel, this golden vessel, to be shown to be cleansed? Consider this carefully. Here again, she gives reference Back to Zechariah 4, 11 to 14, and also Zechariah 4, verse 6. We need to keep this in our minds. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Human might, human talent, does not establish the church of God. Neither can human power destroy it are we willing to accept this promise are we willing to take this promise and make it our own as mrs white continues manuscript 140 of 1901 we may go all over the world full of the talk of the word and yet keep christ out of the heart that's fearful The truth is kept in the outer court. And Christ meets us with the words, Friend, how camest thou in hither without the wedding garment? The voice may even utter the highest oracles of God's word. Yet the men may not have put on the wedding garment. They may have rejected the character of Christ. They are building on a sandy foundation hearers of the word, they come to the banquet, but they have not put on the robe of Christ's righteousness. The word of the Holy Spirit to them is a strange work. They are not doers of the word. 
the living oracles are not their guide and their directory. If we're critical with another brother and sister, if we are spreading rumors and innuendo, if we are saying things to lift ourselves up, are we being doers of the word? Is this what Christ would do? Mrs. White continues. We all need to study as never before the parable of the ten virgins. Five of them were wise and five were foolish. All were asleep. The wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. This is the holy oil represented in Zechariah. From Zach in Zechariah 4. This representation is of the highest consequence to those who claim to know the truth. But if we do not practice the truth, we have not received the holy oil, which the two golden pipes empty out of themselves. The oil is received into vessels prepared for the oil. It is the Holy Spirit in the heart, which works by love and purifies the soul. Can the Holy Spirit dwell in a heart that has one foot in heaven and one foot in the earth? From the chat, the comment is made, no. We must have greater confidence and earnestness in practicing of thus saith the Lord. We are not to listen to any voice that will benumb our senses in regard to the white garment of character that we must put on. There is to be no party spirit. What does it mean to you that there is to be no party spirit? To me, it means that this is an individual work. This is not a group situation. We are to be united with God, and we are to be united with one another. Then the prayer of faith will heal the sick. With this statement being read, what does this say about us right now? Are we united with God, and are we united with one another? What say you? What say we today? If this is what is required, and we are not united with one another, and therefore we are not united with God, then we are unable to offer the prayer of faith that will heal the sick. Of course, the work of unity is an individual work. So often what we do is we focus upon the other people who are ununited. And and not seek what we need to do because becoming united with one another is by being united with God, right? As, Correct. So we are to be united with God and with one another. You can't be united with one another if you're not united with God, and you can't be not united with one another if we're all united with God. U union with God is what brings us. It brings union um, between people. So, so we must conclude that in this movement, because the, the division just isn't, you know, between the different groups. The division exists within all of this movement. There's all kinds of division that exists on different levels. Right. And um, so, you know, obviously we have a work to do. We have a huge work to do. I mean, all the studying that we're doing is not in and of itself, the work, it is part of that work because that studying God's word allows us to see things that we wouldn't see. And these things can bring conviction and power. But some people just think, you know, the studying itself is enough. You know, you have to do something with that light that's given to you. It should work repentance. Now, <clears throat> as we go forward, this letter, we're going to read specific paragraphs from it. And portions of this letter can be found in Fourth Manuscript Release 261. Now, is there anything that we would see here symbolic in this Fourth Manuscript Release 261? Here we have the digits. One, Excuse me? Yeah, one, two, one, two, six and 216. 
Exactly. In carrying forward the cause of God, there is to be no injustice, no impartiality. In the heavenly courts, the choicest treasures of God are prepared for his people, that they may work for him in the fragrance of his love. Here again, she repeats Zechariah 4, 12 to 14. Let God's servants have so great a respect for the sacred work which they are handling that they will not bring into it one vestige of selfishness or of sharp dealing. Use not God's sacred things to barter away truth and righteousness and justice and love. Let not men turn their brethren from their rights. Let them not think that God looks with favor on sharp, unholy dealing even though it is done to build up the work. God hates all wrongdoing. Christ's love for his church is not weakness. He will bless the members when they unswervingly vindicate his character, revealing his long-suffering, compassion, gentleness, and love. He will qualify them to represent him by furnishing them with all the needed help. But he will in no case serve with sin. He will not work with the man who makes merchandise of his brethren who are striving to advance the cause by writing or preaching or in some other way. When men are sanctified by the Holy Spirit, they will see the fallacy of educating in the art of selfishness. They will see that it is unjustifiable to do good by robbing one who is filled with an unselfish interest to obtain means for the advancement of the work of God. Many who are condemned by men are vindicated by God. Many who are exalted by human judgment are by God pronounced to be wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Human judgment often errs. Often man condemns his brother because his discernment is defective. God looks at the heart. He reads the motives which prompt to action. God prompts the question, ought I to do this? Satan leads man to say, I can do this. Right is a loyal subject. Might is a haughty tyrant. Leading to warfare, the scourge of the world. Right is a representation of the perfect man in Christ Jesus. It is the foundation of all righteousness and peace, the oil which fills the divine flagons. So here we are. <clears throat> Here, Mrs. White comes back, quotes again, Zechariah 4, 1 to 7. She then returns. Now, okay, before I go forward, is impartiality supposed to be partiality here? Please explain your question. Well, you'd have to go back a few verses here, a few, a few paragraphs. Okay. I, I thought of, I thought it was a typo. It said in heaven, so something, and then it said impartial. Uh, I don't even know where it is now. Sorry. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I can't find where it is. All right. Now, when we started this, this study with Zechariah 4, in the first verse, we're seeing in the first set of verses, the angel which talked with me came again and waked me as a man waked out of his sleep. Who is Zechariah representing when he's being awakened out of his sleep? The wise virgins when they were sleeping. All of the virgins were asleep, weren't they? Yes, they were sleeping. Okay. So, the angel comes, wakes Zechariah, and said unto him, What seest thou? 
And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick all of gold and a bowl on the top of it, and seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps, which are upon the top thereof, and two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl, and the other upon the left side thereof. Then she comes again to quote verses 11 14. So the angel's explaining this. He is showing to Zerubbabel, here's what is being said with Zechariah and regarding Zerubbabel. Those that what? Because the definition of Zerubbabel is come out of Babylon, right? Then I answered and said unto him, what are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? And I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches, which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? And he answered me and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Read this chapter over and over again until you grasp its full meaning. Keep inquiring, what are these, my Lord? There is a work to be done among the churches of Seventh-day Adventists, which has not yet been done. Please remember, this is written in 1901. What was happening within the church in 1901? Well, everything was being run from the General Conference, and, and uh, Ellen White's going to call for reorganization in 1901 at the General Conference session. That's one of the things happening there. Exactly. Don't we have the same situation that's occurring today? Uh, in in which 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 level are you talking about? Let's let's look at the movement right now. We don't have control or a say or a voice within the general conference. Here is the movement. What is the condition of the movement today? Well, if we, we look at what Jeff is doing, Jeff is putting out articles with no real contact with anyone. Um, we have different groups that, um, don't listen to each other. I mean, there's no unity of effort. Correct. Uh, you know, which which is rather disappointing. People are being cut out of discussions and, and so forth. And you know, I don't really know, you know, what the answer to that is. But you know, right now, the the movement's in, in turmoil, and I can understand people being discouraged and kind of giving up on the movement. I mean, it's, you know, we, but it would be similar to, you know, in 1850 with what happened with after October 22nd, where you have, you know, no real discussions going on. You just have people putting themselves in positions and, deciding for others. So I guess it would be a similar situation. Well, it's kind of interesting because if, if we look at this, there was an issue in 1850. If we go 51 years, we then come to 1901, and there was an issue in 1901. By 1952, there was an issue within the Adventist church. Because by 1952, Wheeland and Short were beginning to press the fact that the message of the third angel of Revelation 14 had never been fully, clearly understood. 51 years after that, 2003, and we have the initial portions of this movement all of these are times in which unity was not coming forward we know 
from Scripture, from Ezekiel 8 and 9, that a work is to be done among the churches of the Seventh-day Adventists. Correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. Ministering angels are waiting to see who will take up the work in the right spirit. Mrs. White is writing in 1901 that the spirit that has been going forward is not the right spirit. You may say, wherein must we change? What have we done? It is not my work to enter into details. Let all humble themselves before God, asking for grace and wisdom that they may see wherein they have violated his holy law. Unless his spirit enlightens them, they will never know, even though it is set before them by their brethren. Those who refuse to come into right relation to God, who will not obey the rules of his government, do not bear his mark. So this is a pretty difficult situation because we don't know our true spiritual condition. Right. We're, um, we, we take the things that we believe that often differentiate ourselves from our brethren as as the evidence that we are correct and they are wrong. Right? Correct. So I don't, you know, this is very discouraging. I mean, you look back at the past, you know, the people who built this church and, and what happened to it. And, and then we join this movement that's calling us back to the old paths and, and this movement can't, it's, it's, it's worse than the church. Really, right? Okay. You know, in its sense of self righteousness, its entitlement, its inability to to cooperate and work together. The church has more ability to cooperate and work together than this movement ha ever has. And and so now we're saying, well, this work has to be done. And we're saying, how is it going to be done? Right now, we have to humble ourselves before God, and. And when we say that, we're not pointing a figure at anyone else. Right. Now, there are people who are saying we need to humble ourselves before God, or more specifically, you need to. Right. Agreed. And if we have that attitude that it's somebody else who has to do this, that 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 is the hindrance It's that person is so proud, that person is this problem. Well, then we we are really just condemning ourselves. And and then people will say, like when I say something like this, well, that's just posturing. You're just saying that. You're just pretending to be humble. You know, it's like none of us are humble. But accusing other people is not going to help us. Right. All of us are proud. All of us are self-dependent, self-reliant in, in the negative sense of the word, right? We, we think more of ourselves than we ought to. And as we study, as we pray each day, we are dependent upon God. We, nobody is in a situation where we're no longer dependent upon God. Now, um, this is kind of interesting, this last sentence in this paragraph. Those who refuse to come in right relation with God, who will not obey the rules of his government, do not bear his mark. And, and I watched a, a video yesterday with uh, John Lennox. I don't know if people know who John Lennox is, but he's a mathematics professor from Oxford and a Christian. And um, but he talks in there about uh, um, uh, logic. There's also another guy. Um, uh, what's his name? Um, his last name's Lyle. Jason Lyle, I think it is. He also talks about this as well. I watched it, so they were kind of related videos. Um, but the idea is that God's mind is a logical mind, that there are rules of his government. Those rules of his government are founded upon his character, his faithfulness, his consistency, his unchangeableness, his justice, his fairness, all of those things that that reflect God. 
We don't see those things in the movement at the present time. We're not fair. We're not just. We're not faithful. We're not consistent. And yet we think that the problem is someone else. You know, the movement often looks out. The problem is in the church. You know, all of these things where we're, we're constantly looking at the sins that exist in the world. Well, is it hard to point out the, the sins that exist in the world or the sins that exist in the church or the sins that exist in someone else? A any fool could do that, right? right? What's more difficult is to recognize the sins that exist in ourselves. And that's where the focus has to be. Because when we look out and we see the sins that exist there, the reason we do that is we want to justify ourselves. We're like the Pharisee. I'm, I'm thankful I'm not like other men are. You know, I fast twice in the week, give tithes of all I possess, or I'm like this publican. You know, I'm not like that at all. But we're not going to go down to our house justified. The publican says, God be merciful to me, a sinner. He doesn't lift so much of his eyes up to heaven. He has a sense that he's a sinner. Do we have that sense that we are a sinner? Or do we think of ourselves more highly than we ought? And that is, of course, the key, right? So if God is going to accomplish this work, he's not going to accomplish it with pe by people who are critical, judgmental, arrogant, um, uh, who are overconfident, who are unteachable. And yet that is describing us. So I don't know how we think that we're going to accomplish this work. Well, the statement is one that condemns all. We have a choice to come into a right relation to God to bear his mark or to continue as we have been. Let all who claim to be reformers be reformers in the fullest sense of the word. The Lord is merciful. He does not chastise his people because he hates them, but because he hates the sins that they are committing. He must chastise them that they may return to their loyalty. He designs their punishment to be a warning to them and to others. No one need walk in darkness. No one need say, specify to me the precise wrongs of which I am guilty. To those who say this, I give the word of the Lord. Search prayerfully and you will know. Now, symbolically, is there anything about this manuscript, manuscript 108 from 1901 that we might consider literally mrs white asks this question if the warnings and the reproofs given in the word of god and in the testimonies of his spirit are not plain enough what words would be sufficiently plain to bring about a revival and reformation what kind of question is she asking here brothers and sisters it wouldn't be i mean it you have to it's rhetorical yeah okay it, yes it's very rhetorical but here's my here's my point didn't christ have a parable that he told of the rich man lazarus well yeah there's that's one of the parables and didn't those hearing this parable be warned that if they would not listen to the instructions given by Moses, that they would not hear even an angel that came down from heaven? For if one was raised from the dead. Or if one was raised from the dead is right. Did they listen to Lazarus when he was raised from the dead? No. Did they listen to Jairus' daughter? Did they listen to any of those that were raised from the dead after Christ's crucifixion? Well, some people might have, but I don't yes, know. Yes, some might have. But if the warnings 
and the instruction that are given in the word of God and in the testimonies of his spirit are not plain enough. So in other words, here she is giving us the casket, the 360 casket. If the warnings of the Old and the New Testament and the warnings of the spirit of prophecy are not plain enough, what words will be sufficiently plain to bring up a revival and a reformation? Consider this carefully today. Think of this as we are studying, as we are going forward. If God's people were turned from their wrong ways and seek counsel from him, he will be spared a repetition of their chastisement. Didn't God chastise the children of Israel as they came out of Egypt? Wasn't he forced to chastise them many times as they kept going to the nations around them and then returning to God? Our father waits long for his erring people to repent that he may remove the rod from them and grant them his forgiveness and favor, filling their hearts with his peace and joy. But those who in self-compliance, self-complacence, excuse me, strengthen themselves in following their own way, they must be left to suffer the consequence of their wrong course. Cause will be followed by the sure result. Are we to be self-complacent today? Are we to be like the Pharisee that stood in the temple saying, I thank God that I am not a woman. I thank God that I am not like this tax collector. No, we are not supposed to be so. But yet, many times within the movement, we see self-complacency. We are being allowed and being offered that our Heavenly Father is ready to pour out the latter rain. The latter rain has been falling ever since September 11th, 2001. But have we been ready to receive it? This is falling upon us. It's falling upon all of us. But are we cleansed to be able to give this to others? I would have to say the answer here is no. Because we think that we're better than we are. And I put myself first among those sinners. We must think of this. We must consider this carefully. In all ways, as we go forward. Do you have any questions or comments for what we have been covering today? Do you have any thoughts of things that we have not addressed? All right. Shall we then close our session? Gracious Father in heaven, please forgive us of our sins. Please forgive us of our self-complacency. Please forgive us of our critical spirit. Help us now. Guide us. Direct us. So that which is done may bring glory to your name. We thank you for this Sabbath, Father. We thank you for the blessings that you are providing. Direct us now. Show us where you would have us to be. May your will be done. As we go forward, Father, we pray for your blessing upon Stephen as he offers the next presentation, the next study. I thank you for each one that has been here today. I thank you for the contributions, the questions, and the comments. Help us and strengthen us, Father, so that we may follow you and not walk according to the fire of our own kindling. We thank you 
for this. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.